Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending from where you are dialing in. My name is Matthias Weller, and it is my privilege and pleasure to host this conference together with my colleague, Professor Lee Rabinski, to whom I will hand over in a few moments for her welcome to you. We feel greatly honored by the huge interest in this event. We have all received almost 300 registrations. Uh, registrants are still dialing in. Welcome to all of you. But let me welcome specifically those amongst you who suffered from the Holocaust for taking the effort to participate today. For the last three years, it has been our objective and motivation to embark on a meaningful and respectful academic discourse in our joint classes of the universities of Bonn and Tel Aviv on the restitution of Nazi looted art in comparative perspectives. And we are grateful and excited that this innovative project is being marked today by this public conference with truly eminent guest speakers for which a truly eminent global audience has gathered. Before we go into the subject matter, let me express my sincere thanks to my colleague, Professor Lee Rabilski, and to the Tel Aviv University and its academic team, Eyal Dolev and Shelley Pasternak, in the first two years, Rachel Klagsbrunn, as well as to the University of Bonn and the German academic team, Dorit Selting and Jakob Riedel, in former years, Elaine Schäfer and Antonetta Stefani. It was a true pleasure and privilege working together in this teaching project. This being said, I hand over to you, Lira, for your welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and welcome everyone to this uh, very exciting a concluding conference. Thank you, Professor uh, Veller, my dear colleague and partner in this exciting class for the last three years. Thank you also the assistants and uh, uh, presenters from Bonn University and here in Tel Aviv University. Again, Eyal Dolev, Shelly Pasternak and Rachel Klaxbaum, who helped form the concept for the class and assisted us for the first two years. I'm glad to speak here with you today and share some of my thoughts about the prehistory and possible future direction of the, um, of the Washington Conference principles. The idea for this class was born during a conference, the Restitution Dialogues uh, organized by Minerva Center for Human Rights here in Tel Aviv University in collaboration with Professor Mayo Moran from Toronto University and Alex Herman, director of the Institute of Art and Law in London. Professor Veller joined us in this exciting international conference that was to be the first of three conferences to take place in Tel Aviv, Toronto and London. Unfortunately, the pandemic hit and we had to cancel the uh, two of the physical conferences. But thanks to our online class, we were able to continue and have two more online conferences under the Restitution Dialogue Umbrella and Bonn Tel Aviv Partnership. This year, just as we were about to embark on the classes, Hamas conducted its murderous attack on 7 October and Israel University's classes closed down. The only class in Tel Aviv University Law School that received a special permission to continue under these very challenging times was our class due to its format and special importance. I'm very thankful to our students and team who insisted on conducting our class even under missile attacks. Our conference concludes three very intensive and exciting Teaching, um, teaching experience, which opened up for me the exciting field of provenance research and the new ways legal practice and research could and had adapted itself in order to find just and fair solutions. This course 
would not have been possible without a generous grant from Minerva Center for Human Rights. And here in Tel Aviv University, we are looking for new ways to continue this collaborative project in the following years. Now, allow me to present our keynote speaker, Ambassador Stuart Eisenstein. It is impossible to cover Ambassador Eisenstadt career achievements in just a few sentences. During a decade and a half of public service in three US administrations, Ambassador Eisenstadt had, has held a number of key senior positions, including Chief White House Domestic Policy Advisor to President Jimmy Carter, U.S. Ambassador to the European Union and the Secretary of Commerce for International Trade and the Secretary of State for Economic Business and Agricultural Affairs and Deputy Secretary of the Treasury in the Clinton administration. Ambassador Eisenstadt had made Holocaust justice and memory a major part of his career. Under the Clinton administration, he served as special representative of the President and Secretary of State on Holocaust era issue and during the Obama administration, a special advisor to the secretaries of state, Clinton and Kerry on Holocaust era issues, negotiating major recoveries from foreign corporations and governments on behalf of survivors and families of victims. He is currently special advisor to secretary of state Blinken on Holocaust issues. Special thanks to Professor Dr. Matthias Weller of Bonn University and Professor Leora Bilski of Tel Aviv University and to my esteemed former colleague, Ambassador J.D. Bendenagel, for organizing this program on the 25th anniversary of the Washington Principles on Nazi Confiscated Art. That colleagues from Germany and Israel have come together to look at one of the most sordid aspects of the Holocaust and its aftermath is an inspiring recognition of the post-war reconciliation between the German and Jewish people. There was nothing inevitable about the Holocaust. It's a tragic example of the worst manifestations of anti-Semitism and racism, a Nazi ideology which targeted Jews as an inferior race, leading one of the most cultured countries in the world to turn on their neighbors. German doctors, lawyers, judges and academics abandoned their ethical standards to follow Adolf Hitler down the abyss. But the Holocaust was facilitated by the indifference of the world to the fate of European Jewry. The result, in 1939 there were 17 million Jews and a world of 1 billion. Today with the loss of 6 million Jews there are only 14.7 million in a world of more than 8 billion. In Germany and throughout Europe, it was also the destruction of the flower of Jewish culture, art, scholarship, and religion. Hitler's original goal was to make Germany Judenrein, free of Jews. He proceeded methodically, step by step, gauging German and world reaction to his gradual disenfranchisement of German Jews. He saw no boycott of the 1936 Olympic Games, even with the 1935 Nuremberg Laws. 1938 was the pivotal year when Hitler got clear signals of the world's indifference to the fate of the Jews. The Anschluss with Austria, the Avian Conference called by President Roosevelt to deal with the plight of German Jewish refugees, where the U.S. and other Western nations refused to lift rigid emigration quotas, the annexation of the Sudetenland through the Munich Pact, Kristallnacht, a furious pogrom with mass arrest and torching of 7,500 German Jewish businesses and 1,000 synagogues. While the British instituted the kinder transports, Hitler paid close attention to the reaction of the U.S. government. When asked if he had anything to say about the violence of Kristallnacht, FDR said, no, I think not. It would be handled by the State Department and said he would not seek to raise emigration quotas. German propaganda capitalized this on, as Goebbels instructed the German press 
to call out the hypocrisy of the West, taking no action to admit more Jews despite their criticism of Kristallnacht. And the American Jewish community largely took a low-key approach to pressuring FDR, concerned about prevailing anti-Semitism. The Holocaust was not only the greatest genocide in world history, it was also the greatest theft of property in history. This was not random, but an integral part of the Nazis' plan to eliminate all vestiges of Jewish life in Germany and Europe, root and branch, homes, businesses, bank accounts, insurance policies, and personal possessions. They also worked to death slave laborers to help run the German war effort. Leading German businesses, banks, and insurance companies became facilitators of the exploitation of Jewish assets. Large numbers of ordinary Germans purchased Jewish assets on the cheap, from pots and pans to costly rugs and furnishings. A significant percentage of the German armed forces was financed by looted Jewish assets. The Allies were aware of the theft of art and in a 1943 London Declaration called on neutral countries not to trade in art looted by the Nazis, often to no avail. Courageously, U.S. Army commanders included curators and art historians embedded as monuments fine arts and archives officers, the famous monuments men, to recapture and protect the looted art in the final period of the war. They obtained as many as 100,000 artworks and, pursuant to an order from President Truman, they were cataloged and returned to their countries of origin, relying on those governments after the war to trace the owners and return the stolen property, but with mixed results. In France, for example, 13,000 artworks considered airless were sold at auction. A similar fate occurred in the Netherlands. The full dimensions of the theft, including art, only became known when the wall of silence was breached after the end of the Cold War, as archives in the former Soviet Union and former East Bloc countries were finally opened. Four scholars in the 1990s wrote path-breaking books and Elizabeth Simpson organized a 1995 Bard Graduate Center Conference in New York entitled The Spoils of War. As many as 600,000 artworks and millions of books and religious objects were stolen with the same efficiency, brutality, and scale as the Holocaust itself. Hitler had several thousand of the most valuable paintings to be installed and a Führer Museum in his childhood home, Linz, Austria, while priceless religious and cultural objects were planned for a museum to a dead race in Prague. At the December 1997 London Gold Conference, returning remaining gold bars stolen by the Nazis, I got the British government to reluctantly agree to have a closing panel on looted art and then invited the participating countries to come to Washington for a conference devoted exclusively to looted art and cultural objects. My staff, led by J.D. Bendenagel and I at the State Department, worked for months leading up to the Washington conference to try to build a consensus among the key countries behind the principles developed initially by the Association of Art Museums directors in the U.S. But key European nations and their museums did not want to part with any of their artworks and resented having American principles imposed on them. So we repackaged them into 11 principles that looked different but kept the essential points. Art confiscated by the Nazis should be identified and publicized. Archives should be open and accessible and establishing that a work of art was confiscated by the Nazis. Consideration should be given to the unavoidable gaps in light of the circumstances of the Holocaust era. Pre-war owners and their heirs should be encouraged to make claims to Nazi looted art and should be taken to achieve a just and fair solution. And if no heirs could be found, commissions should be established to assist in addressing ownership issues and nations were encouraged 
to develop alternative dispute resolution mechanisms to resolve ownership issues. After three days of intensive negotiations in Washington, we teetered on the brink of failure. With only a few hours before the closing session, J.D. and I convened representatives from France, Germany, and Switzerland and assured them the Washington principles would be voluntary. Each nation could act within the context of their own laws. That did it. Critics immediately derided them, however, as useless. They were proven wrong. Philippe de Montebello, then the head of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, said, the art world will never be the same on the issue of the spoilation of art in the World War II Nazi era. The genie, he said, is at last out of the bottle and no resistance, apathy, or silence can ever fit it back again. The Washington principles were not only important in and of themselves in the world of art, but they called world attention to the enormity of the staggering theft that accompanied the genocide. The Washington principles have been transformative, creating a moral and ethical obligation on the holders of Nazi looted art, which many, though not all, have assumed to return them to their rightful owners or devise other just and fair solutions like compensation, long-term loans, and other negotiated agreements. Thousands of artworks, books, and cultural objects have been restituted or claims have been successfully resolved. Five nations, Austria, Germany, France, the Netherlands, and Britain, created claims commissions to provide a forum for heirs to recover art confiscated from their families. They each now publish their decisions that might eventually create guidelines for just and fair solutions. In June 2009, the Washington principles were strengthened by the 47-nation Theresen Declaration at the Prague Holocaust Era Assets Conference organized to their credit by the Czech Republic. Confiscation was broadened to include forced sales and sales under duress, recognizing many Jews and other Nazi targets were forced to sell their artworks to get funds to pay for exit taxes and visas. Private institutions and individuals, not only public museums, were encouraged to support the Washington Principles. Nations were urged to ensure that their legal systems facilitate just and fair solutions and that claims are resolved expeditiously on the merits of the claims. In 2022, the Theresen II Conference was held in Prague, reaffirming the Theresen Declaration, this time by 35 countries. The U.S. Congress on a bipartisan basis has been particularly supportive. The 2016 HERE Act created a unique six-year statute of limitations that would only begin when a claimant had a reason to know of the Nazis' theft of their family's art. The 2018 JUST Act called on the State Department to report on the implementation of the Theresen Declaration by its endorsing countries. And the State Department undertook an exhaustive study, of which I was a part, and in 2020 reported on the implementation of the Theresen Declaration. Among other things, our report found that after a promising start, American museums began asserting affirmative defenses to block restitution of looted art in contravention of the Washington principles, which were to make decisions on the merits. They were lagging in conducting provenance research and had antiquated software which complicated the identification of potential Nazi looted art by claimants. On the 20th anniversary of the Washington Principles, to encourage more art recovery in Germany, I signed a 2018 Memorandum of Understanding with Germany's excellent Federal Commissioner for Culture and Media, Monica Gruters, that quadrupled funds to German museums for provenance research and committed to deny federal subsidies for publicly supported museums that refuse to participate in claims cases for restitution. With the intervention of the U.S. government, the Netherlands reversed their backsliding by their museums and claims commission 
by ending what they called their balance of interest test, which had allowed Dutch museums to keep Nazi looted art if its importance to their collection was determined to outweigh the interests of the heirs. There's been some progress in Israel and Luxembourg, which recently agreed to a comprehensive restitution program. And in Switzerland, Croatia is also moving in the right direction. Christie's and Sotheby's have created full-time restitution staffs to review all art consigned to them to sell or auction that passed through European hands between 1933 and 1945 to be sure they're not dealing in Nazi looted art. They will not sell those with suspicious provenance. Christie's alone has resolved over 300 claims. New organizations like the London-based Commission for Looted Art were created to represent the victims in order to identify, locate, and recover their looted cultural property. And a new Jewish digital cultural recovery project foundation was created in Berlin by the Jewish Claims Conference and the World Jewish Restitution Organization, which will provide an international digital platform for archival documentation, research, and education on the widespread plunder by the Nazis and their allies of Jewish-owned artworks and cultural heritage. France, to its credit, has recently shown commendable leadership, passing a law permitting the deaccession from their museums of Nazi looted artworks in state collections. The Commission for the Compensation of Victims of Spoilation was given authority over looted art, and recommendations on restitution now go to the French Prime Minister's office. In 2022, the French Senate restituted 15 artworks in its collection, and five more artworks have been returned so far in 2023. The Washington principles have had an unexpected recent ripple effect as Germany, France, the Netherlands, the UK, and other countries are reviewing art and cultural objects confiscated during their colonial period. For example, Germany recently returned the famous Benin bronzes to Nigeria decades after taking them. While much has been accomplished, much remains to be done. We're only at the tip of the iceberg. It's estimated that some 100,000 of the 600,000 paintings and cultural objects stolen have never been returned, and getting them back can take decades of hard and expensive work. I believe we should undertake a project to develop best practices, drawing on what we've learned in the 25 years since the Washington Principles were adopted. Now some 14 countries have worked for months to develop these best practices, and we hope to have them ready by March in a conference which the State Department and the World Jewish Restitution Organization has organized. Deaccession laws which bar museums from returning art should be modified for Nazi looted art, as the UK did in 2009 and France has recently done. Statutes of limitation should be amended. Countries should maintain comprehensive statistics on restitution. Flight goods should be covered by the Washington Principles after their escape. Persecuted persons, after all, lost their sources of income, and many survived by selling their artworks under duress. The burden of proof should be on those holding Nazi confiscated art when evidence is produced by the victims of a theft. We should develop creative options for airless looted art where there are no living heirs. Serbia did so in 2016. We must start with provenance research because without that, recoveries are impossible. Yet, it's a very low priority for art museums. In most European countries, too many public and private art museums do not conduct provenance research on their art collections research that's essential to provide information about potential claims for Nazi confiscated art. Most of these museums are European Union member states, but the European Commission and the European Council have done virtually nothing, in my view, to encourage art restitution, 
It's time for the European Union to get off the sidelines. A number of key European countries, such as Poland, need to do more, and others, such as Spain and Portugal, should conduct more provenance research, including to identify art that may have transited their countries during World War II. Russia has done little to follow the Washington Principles, despite legislation signed by President Putin following the Washington Conference. It has an enormous number of artworks, library collections, and archives, which their Soviet trophy brigades brought into the USSR from Soviet-occupied Germany as what they called compensatory restitution for the huge losses of cultural property inflicted on Soviet territory. Now, Russia's invasion and aggression against Ukraine have seen a wanton destruction of Ukraine's cultural heritage and massive theft of art once again in Europe. The functioning of these five European claims commissions should be improved and many more need to be created so their families can recover their looted artworks wherever they appear. Germany, which has been so courageous and generous in supporting Holocaust survivors, has significantly more to do on art restitution, as indicated by their own art commission. Their commission referred to there being a large number of Nazi looted artworks yet to be returned, saying that the lost art database alone lists some 60,000 entries of suspected Nazi looted art, and yet their own art commission has ruled on only 23 cases during its lifetime. To summarize the findings of Germany's own commission, they are as follows. There are no comprehensive statistics in Germany on restitution efforts that have been taken leading to a critical perception of Germany's handling of Nazi looted art worldwide. Their commission can only deal with cases in which both parties agree to participate, but museums are reluctant to do so. Owners or their heirs can't self-initiate cases. Provenance research on collections, which is essential to art recovery, lags. It's been estimated that only 12% of German museums have done provenance research on their collections, and owners of private collections have done next to nothing. When provenance research is done, it is by the museums themselves rather than an independent body, as is used in Austria, France, and the Netherlands. The German Art Commission has no legal status, and its decisions are not binding on the parties. They powerfully conclude, this is their own commission, the lack of a legal basis for an institution that is to decide on the restitution of cultural assets lost as a result of Nazi persecution in the country of the perpetrators is inappropriate and insufficient. And correcting the deficiencies in their operation must now be done, the Commission said, as a matter of urgency in order to silence criticism at home and above all abroad that the Federal Republic of Germany is neither sufficiently able nor really willing to make adequate reparations for Nazi injustice with regard to cultural property. Quite an indictment. The coalition agreement of Chancellor Scholz's German government promised many improvements in the field of restitution, but the Commission notes that none of these points has been implemented. This is Germany's own advisory commission which recommended such legislation. In short, as Germany has been a leader for decades in Holocaust restitution, compensation, education, and memory, which is embedded in their legislation and to which we owe everlasting thanks, it should become a leader also in art restitution with legislation covering public museums, private institutions, and individuals holding Nazi confiscated art, enabling its commission to have a legal basis to make binding and forcible decisions, to allow heirs to self-initiate claims, and to have an independent body do provenance research. 
The Washington Principles and the Theresian Declaration demonstrate the central importance of continued leadership by the United States government, with the same bipartisan support and zeal that we've shown over the past 25 years. The Washington Principles have had a lasting impact with, beyond anything we could have imagined at the time. They're a reminder of the importance of striving for justice. This battle must go on. Special and very sincere thanks and appreciation of ours to Ambassador Stuart Eisenstein for this uh, very important and outlooking key note. When we met at the Terrorism Declaration Conference in Prague in 2022, we also briefed, briefly talked at the reception of the US ambassador at his Prague residence about our joint class on Nazi looted art. And spontaneously, I had this idea of asking him whether he might be willing to appear in this class. He immediately said, yes, I will make a contribution, and here we are. As Stuart Eisenstadt is currently involved in the proceedings of the World Economic Forum at Davos, we agreed on a video message to be able to stay in the exact rhythm of our weekly classes, Wednesdays, 5 p.m. Bonn time, 6 p.m. Tel Aviv time. Once more, special thanks to Stuart Eisenstadt for his contribution. Alongside, at this moment, at the embassy in Prague, James Bindenagel was with us, JD, who is not only Henry M. Kissinger Professor Emeritus for Security and Strategy Studies at the CASIS, the Center for Advanced Security, Strategic and Integration Studies at my university, the University of Bonn, but was also, as has been mentioned already by Stuart Eisenstadt, U.S. Ambassador for Holocaust Issues at the Washington Conference back in 1998. And he also served as the editor of the conference materials. We feel greatly honored to receive a comment of yours, James, JD, following the keynote by Stuart Eisenstadt. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. The floor is yours. Well, it's to me to thank you, professors. Uh, Weller and, and Leora Bleski for the invitation to add a further comment to the next 25, the next 25 years of the Washington Principles on Nazi Confiscated Art. As we gather here to review and digest the work of this Bonn University project with Tel Aviv on restating and reaffirming the Washington Principles, I'm pleased to add some comments to what uh, Stuart Eisenstadt has given on moving from just and fair solutions to establish law or state practice over the next 25 years. Ambassador Eisenstadt was ably highlighted the progress made over the last 25 years and what the Germans and the Europeans have been doing. And equally important is, Professor Weller, your observation that nations participating in the principles have exhibited varying commitments to devising and implementing just and fair solutions to confiscated art over this time. And thus, it's important to do is comparative research, as we know from Lior, that uh, on state practices, including developing consistent best practices, again, as, as Ambassador Eisenstein said, the significant issues of implementation that highlight broader issues now demand our attention. All, all participants in the Washington Principles acknowledge that the Holocaust was one of the greatest crimes of identity-based violence ever seen. It was a crime that was premeditated and explicitly planned to include attacking the property rights of those to be expelled or annihilated. That fact must be re reflected in the work and the workings of the Washington Principles. Holocaust-related confiscation went way beyond the mere theft in many ways. It was not only about eliminating a people and their culture from European society and history, but also about enriching the state with the property of those to be eliminated. The theft went far behind, beyond the higher priced artworks that garner media attention that we see every few weeks. It included everyday cultural objects, crystal, china, silverware, rugs, jewelry, keepsakes. In other words, family heirlooms that defined Jewish culture and social history. 
a distinct segment of European society. The theft went even further. It ultimately included household objects, including clothes and bedding, appliances, pots and pans, even light bulbs. Given the scope of that looting, the Washington principles have always been about more than, than only the return of cultural property. There was no hope at all, or most compensated cultural property could or would ever be returned to original owners or their families for various reasons. Specifically, much of the property was just too generic to be identified. And European law was also not suited to undoing what the Holocaust had wrought, nor were post-World War II governments generally disposed to do the hard work of restitution even then when the facts were fresh. If not just about restitution, what then is the purpose of the Washington Principles? The Washington Principles must use the legacy and the lessons of the Holocaust cultural property confiscation to prevent identity-based violence like this form from ever happening again. This is the effort of never again will involve addressing two critical problems that have become clear over the last 25 years. Let me explain. First, governments must stop hoarding information about provenance, the movement of Holocaust era cultural property during and after the war and claims for restitution. This information relates to a proven and acknowledged genocide. Governments and museums, universities, auction houses, and art dealers, they regulate, owe a public duty to collect, to organize, and disseminate this information broadly and comprehensively. This information will advance multiple goals. A thwart denial, which has always been and remains a serious issue. It will honor the memory of victims by allowing them and their families to understand how the Holocaust unfolded against them. It will commemorate the rich and social history, cultural history destroyed by the Holocaust, including creating a basis for education, remembrance, and museum programming. Finally, it will serve as a powerful reminder of what must never again be allowed to happen as recognized by the United Nations under the principles of transitional justice, prevention of non-recurrence mm -hmm. is perhaps the most essential duty that states owe to their citizens respect against the scourge of identity-based violence, as we've seen in the Russian aggression against Ukraine. As such, governments should publish comprehensive information and statistics on research undertaken findings achieved even if partial, and lists of works identified, restituted, or otherwise subject to just and fair solutions. Information should also be published on all claims made, how quickly museums and other government departments respond to claims and in inquiries, the outcomes achieved, given due regard, of course, to confidentiality as to the ultimate dispositions. Governments should mandate a time limit regarding how quickly museums must respond to inquiries and provide resources to assist museums struggling to react promptly and to efficiently to inquiries. It's my view that Germany must lead on this transparency. And I'll give you an example of the federal government. The federal government does not need to defer to the responsibility of the states, the lender, on Holocaust looted art issues. I recognize, of course, the sovereignty of the state's culture, but the United States Department of State turned over the looted art from Monuments Men's Collections to the points, Monument, Monuments Men's Collecting Points to the German federal government in the 1950s. They're managed by the Federal Art Administration, the Kunstverwaltung des Bundes, which has loaned out some objects to various government offices, other places for viewings, and those objects not loaned or stored. Most importantly, having violated the rights and dignity of persecuted groups under the National Socialist regime, it is the responsibility, I believe, of the German federal government to take more direct steps to publish looted art it still holds for both Holocaust remembrance and the prevention 
of future genocides. The Lost Art Database, Lost Art Day A, lists individual objects and collections that have been or suspected to have been confiscated as a result of Nazi persecution. As you heard from Stuart Eisenstadt, there are tens of thousands of them. As an example for other governments, perhaps even for the, the lender, the Federal Art Administration should publish the federal government's Nazi looted art as a separate collection website. As with the French m &R collection or the Dutch NK collections, the Federal Art Administration should consider creating an entry highlighting its collection and its provenance research rather than listing individual mixed objects on lostart.de. Its status can be determined only by organizing the federal collection as a distinct and recognized collection. After all, the website is the central contact point for information, advice, and help and hold holdings for inquiries regarding art and records and archives, research and claims. And then second, governments must stop treating Holocaust era confiscated property as if they own it. They do not and cannot. Not only is this stolen property, but it is also property in which governments were complicit in the theft and the subsequent movement and non-return after the war. As important, at the end of the Second World War, allies were clear about one thing. Cultural property was be, to be returned to its country of origin so that it could be returned to its true owners. Governments were not the owners of this property, but were custodians, a term used for cultural property moving through allied collection points. There was never any agreement that these countries would treat the stolen property as state property. The Federal Art Commission has, over the last few years, differentiated its position of ownership of Nazi looted art objects. And according to the Article 134 of the Basic Law, which applies to assets owned by the Reich and provides then that these objects would be property of the federal republic, federal level of the federal republic. Applying this determination, however, to the Nazi confiscated art is problematic for in two ways. First, the Reich's so-called ownership has been recognized as illegal and void. The state must make clear that it is only holding this property as a custodian and that its rights of possession are not superior to those of the true owners. Similarly, cultural objects returned to the federal government by the allied collecting points must be recognized as property acquired under persecution. Again, the German state can be nothing more than a custodian of this property in perpetuity if need be, but it is not enough for the Bund now to say that looted cultural objects are held in the Bund's possession, absent a clear and unequivocal statement of the German government, no one reading the website or Bund statements would understand that the German government was not claiming ownership of this property, and that would be unacceptable. In fact, treating Holocaust-era conf confiscated property as possessions of the government also opens the questions of whether these objects should somehow be transformed into state property. That answer has to be that they cannot be so transformed because, frankly, doing so would be to confiscate them a second time. Claiming possession would be seen as a form of ownership and also risks becoming a form of Holocaust denial by muddying the historical heritage of the property and undermining our efforts to account for how this property left its actual owners and was not returned. Something that will undermine what must be our most, our, must be our continuing efforts to prevent Holocaust from happening again. Accordingly, let me suggest governments adhere to the Washington principles could mandate any property and government and museum possessions to which Holocaust related transfer or confiscation cannot be ruled out and held in perpetual trust as custodians. There are four things that museums could do, governments could, and museums could do each year. First, they could list 
all the works that they have in trust. Second, they could have providence information that exists as to each work in trust be made public. Whether there is any information on the valid holders of the property would be made in the third point. And the fourth point, whether steps have been taken to contact and taking the initiative to contact owners or heirs. Here, the federal government has the sovereign right, the German government has the sovereign right to determine and clear, declare the legal status of this Holocaust looted property. Having stolen or caused the loss of property, including, as Stuart Eisenhower said, through forced private sales, the German government may determine the status of that property to the extent that it has come to the hands of the German government. In particular, the German government must make perfectly clear that it has decided it may never, never gain nor profit, even indirectly, from the wrongs committed by the national social in the national socialist era. As such, the German state should announce that it will treat Holocaust looted property only as a property held, as I said, in per perpetual custody, custodial trust by the German government. This act alone by the German government would be consistent also with the foundational principles of German law and policy with international law. It would also establish an important precedent for other nations, including under the Washington principles that would aid in preventing future genocides, mass atrocity crimes, by undermining the profit motive that often accompanies looting of art. And finally, the idea's importance is to show that being true to the Washington principles has always been about more than the simple return of property. At its core, the Washington principles must be about creating processes and practices that make any future Holocaust less likely. And with that, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you very much for your inspirational uh, uh, talk. And now, uh, from these insightful comments, it is my great pleasure to invite my colleague and co-teacher, Professor Dr. Matthias Weller, to present his remarks. Professor Weller is the Alfred Krupp von Bollen und Halbach uh, Professor for Civil Law art and cultural property law, and the director of the Institute for German and International Civil Procedural Law from the University of Bonn. Uh, Professor Vela, please. Thank you very much, Lira, for this kind introduction. It is my task here tonight to report a bit on how we structured our course program and think about what could be lessons to be learned from teaching such a complex and demanding subject matter as the restitution of Nazi looted art in comparative perspectives. First of my points, we need more of such teaching. This will not surprise you. And it meets with a central demand that was formulated at the Terrorism Declaration Conference in 2022 by Wesley Fisher. At the same time, we do not see so much of such teaching at universities, to our knowledge. Our program has been the first and only one on Nazi looted art uh, across a whole semester, both in Israel and in Germany, at least as far as the international and interdisciplinary approach is concerned. Lira is an excellent and outstanding researcher in Holocaust studies coming from public law and human rights in particular. I am a private lawyer, private law, uh, academic, private international law scholar with a special focus on art and cultural property law coming from international dispute resolution. That was already a productive constellation in itself. Over the last three winter semesters, the course attracted, roughly speaking, in total 80 students from Israel and 80 from Germany for weekly lectures on screen. 
And we were rotating weekly between lectures on law and providence research. We invited guest speakers from all kinds of backgrounds from all over the world. And many of them are with us tonight. Special thanks to these eminent guest speakers, claimants, claimants, lawyers, provenance researchers from leading museums, directors of state institutions involved in the subject matter, such as the Deutsche Zentrum Kulturgutverluste, the German Lost Art Foundation, as well as the German Federal Commissioner for Culture and Media. Uh, its office funded one of the courses, um, and we are very grateful for this support, as well as, for example, representatives of the uh, Ministry of Justice of Israel, as well academic specialists for the practice in the respective jurisdictions that have established a restitution commission according to Articles 10 and 11 of the Washington Principles, which are Germany, Austria, France, the Netherlands, and the UK. But also, as many of you know, from Israel and Switzerland, two countries that are currently in the process of setting up such commissions. And we even had the honor of welcoming high-ranking members from European restitution commissions who talked about their demanding work and their experiences. Overall, I believe it was a unique and, to my mind, extremely rewarding and enriching experience. So my first takeaway for the next 25 years would be that teaching programs and courses of such a kind or a similar approach should become a regular element in the curricula of universities of all countries that participate in the Washington Principles. Second point, we should try to come together face to face as much as possible. We are doing here the opposite. I'm aware of that, but that's a different situation than teaching young people in the classroom. And again, you will not be surprised to hear this uh, of my uh, propositions um, and probably share it immediately. Our program benefited a bit from the pandemic in that universities became more open-minded to teaching via video conference and in that universities became better equipped technically. In addition, students began accepting teaching via video. And yet, it always remains a second best. Some students, I think, tended to remain a little bit too passive. Some are uh, reluctant to open their cameras and to intervene. This would probably be much better in the real classroom. I do not want to criticize any of our students. On the contrary, I would like to sincerely thank each and every student, and many of them are here with us tonight, who decided to enroll and to stay in the course. Many of you in the audience know that in Germany, at least at the law faculties, there is no uh, practice of obliging anyone to stay in a course, even if one has enrolled and so it was often a moment of tension of mine to open the video room and to see whether there would be any German students left. There would have been nothing for me to do about this. At the end, I was extremely glad to see three times in a row that most of its German students remained in the course, but I would have wished to see more participation. Probably the main mistake was anyway, that we as the professors and the lecturers talked too much and too long. So this would be another takeaway. We would really need more time for discussion and for Q and A. And of course, the topic itself is intimidating. I remember very well when I introduced in an earlier class of mine here in Bonn before we started the joint classes with Tel Aviv, a Jewish colleague of mine who was announced to speak about his experiences as a Holocaust survivor of the second generation and his experiences as a claimant of Nazi looted art in several jurisdictions. The German students face to face were to a certain extent inhibited to intervene, to ask questions, etc. They were afraid of making mistakes. At the end of the day, the class went extremely well First and foremost, because my guest speaker turned out to be a true talent in talking with these young people. And at the end of the day, there was a positive atmosphere on the personal level, despite the distressing topics that were discussed. 
And the students declared afterwards that this was one of the most intense moments in their academic education. I guess such experience is only possible face to face, not really on screen. So my second takeaway for the next 25 years would be to try to offer settings in which Jewish and non-Jewish students, Jewish and non-Jewish speakers meet in person. I know that this is far from easy to realize because uh, often people live very long distances apart, but it would be worth trying. We managed once after the first joint class to get travel grants from the state of North Rhine-Westphalia, the state in which the University of Bonn is located in Germany, for five German students to attend a conference on the subject matter organized by my colleague Amna Lehavi at the Harry Ratzinger Law School of the Reichmann University in Herzliya. To the extent we do not manage to come up with such funding for traveling and bringing people together face to face, we should stay with my first takeaway, and that is offering teaching programs at least online. Third point, lots of food for thought. Let me point out that it was not so much our task to tell the students what was right or what was wrong. Rather, we trusted in the students' ability to make up their minds themselves from the diverse positions and views that were presented to them. Our task was more to provide for a reliable fundament of knowledge to base informed judgments on rather than to prescribe opinions, which resulted in a kind of Socratic constellation in which, as we know, ever and ever more questions come up and remain than answers can be given. But this fundament of knowledge that grows thereby included um, not only technical, legal knowledge, which is important, I am tempted to underline this as a legal academic, but also cultural and even emotional knowledge to understand the context. For example, I remember a remarkable presentation of Liras on the return of voice on Rachel Auerbach's contribution at the Eichmann proceedings to a new conception of the victim's testimonies. We would definitely need more time for such historical and cultural embedding of our topic, psychological embedding. And if I may borrow and further develop a concept that was introduced to us by another guest speaker at one of our earlier annual public conferences in the context of our lectures, Hagi Kenan, professor for philosophy at the University of Tel Aviv, we should further elaborate on what could be a hermeneutics of restitution. And based on this concept, we could perhaps envisage developing something like restitution studies or on a more abstract level, reconciliation studies. This is at least something I would very much like to pursue in my function as a founding member of the newly established interdisciplinary Bonn University Center for Reconciliation Studies. Fourth point, and the only one that I would like to present here directly on the level of contents, and that is an issue, so to speak, on the meta level of our issues, and this is the importance of transparency. I think, inspired from countless debates and discussions in our classes and elsewhere, and also James Bindelagel referred to it in his talk today, that transparency on all levels and in all respects is key to any progress in our matters. As early as 1950, Hannah Arendt taught us with reference to Immanuel Kant about the radical evil, das radikal böse in German, of the Holocaust that destroyed the trust in humanity in a most fundamental and unprecedented way. Against this background, we cannot expect the victims and their families, the claimants, to naively trust in restitution proceedings set up in the spheres of the states that have to take the, res the historical responsibility for the Holocaust. First and foremost, but not alone, my own country, Germany. Rather, these states, in implementing the Washington principles faithfully and meaningfully, must provide, to the fullest extent possible, for transparency on all levels 
in order to make themselves observable and where you can observe things you do not need to trust. What does that mean in concrete terms? First, this demand relates to transparency in respect to the stocks of museums. The claimants, the Jewish world in its entirety, as well as the public in general, have a right to know about the existence and the whereabouts of all items in public collections. It's public property, or at least property serving public purposes. And we are the public. In addition, the state of provenance research must be made public in respect to all objects. Second, each and every just and fair solution must be made public, since it is a concern of the public, and this is all of us, to come to terms with remaining unjust enrichments attributable to the Holocaust. Secret bilateral settlements, as they occur so often in Germany and Switzerland, but also elsewhere, may comfort the individual parties involved, and that is already much, but such settlements neglect the public or collective dimension of the restitution process. We need to record this overall process, the entirety of this process, in order to be able to respond to recurring and pressing and well-justified questions on where are we standing in the matter and where are, whether we are on the right track. The publication of just and fair solutions must include the respective reasonings on how the respective solution was configured and why. Summarizing short press releases with generic statements of effects are not sufficient to serve the public purpose of restitution. In particular, the recommendations of restitution commissions must provide for comprehensive and convincing reasoning. As a matter of fundamental procedural rights of both sides in such proceedings, this requirement most intensely relates to arguments and submissions of each of the parties. They must be fully addressed by a commission. Third, and maybe most importantly, there must be transparency in respect to the reasons as such, and this relates to the assessment frameworks, or as I like to put it, to the grammar of reasons for restitution. Recommendations and decisions must be as predictable as possible. The restitution practice needs to be stabilized by standardization, a demand forcefully put forward already in the hearing of the jury committee of the European Parliament on our matters in 2019, where I had the privilege of moderating one of the panels and I fully endorsed this state, this, this demand. One of the most outstanding colleagues in the field, the late Norman Palmer, co-founder and academic principal of the Institute of Art and Law in the United Kingdom, and at the time member of the UK Spoliation Advisory Panel, perfectly set the stage in his seminal contribution as early as in 2012 under the title of The Best We Can Do, a presentation at the first public conference on the occasion of the meetings of the five European restitution commissions held at the Peace Palace in The Hague. As many of you know, for my part, I am seeking to further contribute with what I call a restatement of restitution rules for Nazi confiscated art, a, comp a comparative legal analysis of now 1,100 pages on the practice of the restitution of Nazi looted art in six jurisdictions, Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, France, UK, Switzerland. Over the last 25 years, in order to further pave the way for meaningful and informed and this is transparent, and this means intellectually honest discourses on best practices during the next 25 years. I presented this idea for a restatement at the above mentioned conference at the Peace Palace of The Hague for the first time. The results of this research will be released during the next months, both in German and in English language. After five years of intense work, in a team of a dozen highly motivated and highly engaged researchers at the University of Bonn, and many of them are with us tonight. 
Our work will be freely available on the internet. And of course, our hope is to contribute to transparency in the thinking, in the reasoning about just and fair solutions. You are, of course, aware that this academic research on the last 25 years is not binding anyone. It is simply an academic textbook that you may wish or maybe not to consult when you will be thinking about just and fair solutions in the next 25 years. Let me close by coming back to teaching. What might be an idea for the next winter semester is a full course on this restatement. The idea is to explain and discuss step by step the findings, the underlying assumptions, the theoretical framework and propositions of this work in weekly classes, perhaps one week in German and the following week the same topic in English. And at each session, we would like to open the classroom to the public, both on site and via video conference. At any rate, we would very much like to maintain and further develop our wonderful academic friendships with our colleagues from Tel Aviv University and elsewhere. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Without any further ado, it's now my pleasure and privilege to introduce you, my wonderful colleague, my teaching partner, Professor Lyra Bilski. She holds the Benno Jitter Chair in Human Rights and Holocaust Research at the Faculty of Law of the Tel Aviv University. And she is the director of the Minerva Center of Human Rights at the Tel Aviv University. Dear Lira, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. It's a pleasure to listen to you. And uh, I would like to look uh, uh, to the past and to the future in order to gain some perspective on our uh, uh, class on the Washington Principles. Um, in my short remarks, I would like to show how we can gain a critical perspective on the Washington Conference principles through a comparative lens, posit positing them between two restitution struggles that we did not discuss in our classes, an early a, a post-war Jewish restitution struggle over the return of books and contemporary and contemporary post-colonial struggles to decolonize European museums. The large and systematic involvement of the law in Jewish cultural dispossession during the Holocaust has led Jewish organizations in the wake of World War II to take on an international struggle to reform the law of restitution as envisioned by the Allies by articulating the novelty of the crime of cultural genocide and by demanding direct recognition of a stateless victim group as the proper addressee of restitution and as a trustee of its lost cultural treasures. This early struggle has largely disappeared from the annals of law. By the 1990s, the instrumentable legal obstacles to the restitution of Nazi looted art led to enacting the 1998 Washington Conference principle marking an ethical turn that is carving a special exception for the Holocaust. However, as we saw throughout our classes, the attempt to limit the legal precedent by avoiding law altogether did not hold. The practice of restitution, as it developed in national advisory panels, eventually led to comparisons and the articulation of best practices. And we just heard now about the um, restatement project of my colleague. Our three years class has contributed to developing this comparative framework by bringing together legal and provenance experts from different national settings to discuss common dilemmas and solutions. In my talk, I would like to try to take a step backward in order to gain a perspective on the paradigm of restitution entailed by the Washington principle that we have discussed so intensely in our classes. In order to do so, I return to the early post-war Jewish uh, campaign. 
I will then draw a comparison between the early Jewish cultural struggle over books and contemporary offer efforts for post-colonial restitution as envisioned in the South of War report, dealing with African demands to decolonize European museums. My goal is to articulate an alternative vision of restitution to the one advanced by the Washington Principle, a collective holistic approach in the center of which stands the dispossessed group as a whole and the need to reconnect it to its lost culture. The current restitution paradigm envisioned by the Washington Principles originated in the late 1990s. It adheres to a private property paradigm and focuses on rare works of art with huge economic value. It was brought forward by private individuals and involves complicated provenance research and a case-by-case -case incremental restitution. In contrast, the campaign for post-colonial restitution, the demand to decolonize European museums, advances a collectivist paradigm it is brought by African states demanding the return of their cultural heritage from European museums. It envisions a massive return of African collections and articulates its demands in holistic terms, the return of culture, including human remains and religious objects, thus resisting the narrower um, focus on rare works of art. Most importantly, Although the post-colonial struggle is over the return of museum objects, its real aim is the rehabilitation of the colonized community by reconnecting it to its lost cultural heritage. In other words, it sees restitution through the prism of memory as the return of memory and understand it as part of a healing process of dealing with the traumatic colonial past. If we focus on the Washington principle uh, uh, paradigm, the difference between the two struggles cannot be bigger. However, if we look back to the earlier restitution struggle led by international and transnational Jewish organizations and focused on the return of books, libraries, and archives, we can begin to notice some important similarities. The early campaign for cultural restitution sought to adjust the law of restitution to the crime of genocide, suffered by the Jews as a collectivity. The Jewish activists feared that the Allies' restitution policy was ill-fitted to address the Jewish reality of a huge category of airless property that was left at the wake of the Holocaust. From a Jewish perspective, the main difficulty emanated from the restitution's law fundamental principle of return to the status quo ante, to which the Holocaust posed a major challenge, as only a few and diminished and devastated Jewish communities remained in Europe. And international Jewish organizations did not see a future at that time for Jews in Europe. To overcome this difficulty, Jewish jurists set out to modify the law by creating a link between cultural restitution and the crime of genocide. They argued that restitution should not be understood solely through the lens of private property, but rather as a countermeasure to cultural genocide, as a way to rehabilitate the group as such. Faced with formidable legal difficulties, this struggle aimed to transform three core premises of restitution in international law. From individual restitution of private property to collective restitution to the victim group directly. From a backward looking return to the status quo ante to a forward looking restitution as a means for cultural rehabilitation and reconstruction. And finally, from a conception of property focused on economic value to a more holistic understanding of cultural objects as aspects of a living Jewish culture. The return should be understood also as a way to return the agency and control of a non-status group over its cultural heritage. Books stood at the center of this early Jewish cultural restitution struggle. Let me turn to the South of War report. In November 2017, Emmanuel Macron commissioned two eminent scholars uh, to inquire about African artifacts in French museums and suggest a legal and political framework for their return. 
in 2018, the report advocated a new relational ethics between France and Africa as a basis for a policy of restitution. The report explained that colonialism and its accompanying looting denied Africa of its memory. Reading the report against the early Jewish restitution, we can see that both struggles began with the need to go beyond civil law, seeking to locate the demand for restitution as linked to the nature of the collective crime, as one targeting a group and its uh, culture for destruction by pillaging and destroying its culture and identity. Second, both struggles resisted a private property paradigm. In both cases, advocating for collective restitution stemmed from understanding it within a reparative justice framework meant to rehabilitate the group as a whole by way of reconnecting it to its lost culture. The South Savoir report purports to rectify colonialism's harm in Africa and opts for a therapeutic discourse of post-trauma and memory. Instead of treating objects as individual artworks, the report sees them as part of a collective cultural heritage. It envisions material restitution as a way for African communities to get back their memory and cultural identity. Third, the comparative framework helps identify the central role of law, not only in facilitating and carrying out a systematic crime of looting and confiscation, but also in ensuring the durability of its results by creating legal obstacles to restitution. Thus, in both cases, the need arises to devise legal tools that overcome legal obstacles. In the case of the early Jewish campaign, after a protracted legal and political struggle, international Jewish organizations were able to convince the Americans to change their policy and enact a special law pertaining to Jewish cultural restitution to overcome the rule of return to the state of origin in cases of heirless property and to be recognized as trustees of heirless Jewish artifacts. As such, they were able to promote a redistributive program of Jewish cultural assets, refusing to treat their books as museum objects for dead Jewish culture in Europe. In contrast, Although the South Savoir report recognized the need to re-socialize objects to new social settings in Africa, it was still modeled to a large extent on the concept of a museum and the discretion it envisions is within the confines of professionalism of museum practices. A another important difference that arises from this comparison regards the addressee of restitution. Both the early Jewish and post-colonial struggles focused on the group and not on the individual. However, while the early Jewish campaign led to the direct recognition of organizations such as Gerso and JCR of a non-stated group, the post-colonial restitution is envisioned as interstate matter, resulting in marginalizing the groups that directly suffered from genocide like the Heraro and Nama in Germany and Namibia reparation negotiations. Thus, while the early Jewish um, restitution struggle went beyond material struggle and served as a site of regaining agency to the victim group, in the post-colonial restitution struggle, civil society organizations and groups are still struggling to gain voice. Um, let me uh, uh, point to the limits of the comparison. The uniqueness of the Holocaust thesis and the fear that every comparison might end up relativizing the Holocaust have produced great resistance to comparing the Holocaust with other genocides. Critics of the uniqueness thesis argue that the hegemony of the Holocaust on international law's conception of genocide occludes the recognition of indigenous or post-colonial forms of suffering. Common to these critiques is the understanding that using the Holocaust as a model can be inhibiting and can marginalize certain groups and distort our understanding of history. The Holocaust uniqueness thesis can also explain the road taken by the Washington Conference principles. In terms of law, by carving out a Holocaust exception to the law of restitution, that is by turning the ethical principles 
uh, the international community found a way to overcome the difficult legal obstacles that stem from the systematic involvement of the law in cultural looting and destruction during the Holocaust. However, creating a Holocaust exception by agreeing on special ethical principles only to Nazi looted art uh, to overcome legal obstacles also means that such an approach might hinder the creation of legal precedents. During the three years course, we saw how gradually in practice, these boundaries have been overcome. For example, the institutional infrastructure that was created to assist and fund provenance research of Nazi looted art led to the creation of parallel structures to deal with colonial collection in European museum. Even more important, what began as an ethical, extra-legal approach to Nazi looted art led back to the law. We notice, for example, the articulation of new human rights, first of indigenous people and then to more general rights to access culture. And finally, we can begin to notice attempts to overcome a statist bias and to recognize the dispossessed group directly as the subject of cultural rights. By broadening our view and going back to the early Jewish cultural restitution and going forward to the post-colonial restitution struggles, we notice a penandrum. The early Jewish restitution struggle began with a transnational non-statist group demanding direct recognition to the victim group by international law. Then the penandrum moved between national cultural patrimony and international universal museums and lately turned back to the group, recognizing the source community as having rights to access its culture and participate in the provenance research. I believe that the next 25 years, we will be slowly moving away from the individualist private property paradigm envisioned in the Washington principles to a group paradigm and a memory framework. A more relational approach to restitution will be developed as suggested by the South of Walpole, and technology will be enlisted to go beyond the return of physical objects to creating sites of memory. For example, by creating a common digital catalogs and libraries that will be created in collaboration. Restitution will be envisioned not as the end result, transferring a material object, but also as a process through which dispossessed groups regain agency by creating new relations between communities and objects. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lira, for this uh, really, truly inspiring uh, presentation of something that could be called uh, collective perspectives or a collective approach to our subject matter in opposition maybe or in conjunction with uh, a more private law oriented approach that would maybe um, configure our topic as an ownership dispute. And I think both of these levels are in a way present in our topic. I think uh, we've got a sense how fascinating um, these classes were um, to get this input from very diverse perspectives and standpoints. And I think that made the value for all of us and hopefully also for our audience tonight to come together in this um, configuration, if I may put it that way. It's time for the discussion. Um, we enabled your uh, function to, um, to raise your electronic hands. You should be able now to um, use the chat. You should be able now to unmute yourself and to, to open the cameras. And we very much invite you to pose questions to the speakers. And uh, allow me to explain that we would like to pr proceed as follows. We would like to invite first statements on screen live, so to speak, and uh, then we will go to maybe questions um, in the chat. And I think, um, James, you are the first one who raised um, the hand. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And, and uh, Professor Bilski, I wanted to just add to your comments, uh, because the Washington principles were not designed for private property restitution. They were actually derived much broader. And what we did in the in the first instance was we focused on books and Judaica 
and actually worked those issues in the process of the negotiation because it was to recognize those are very clearly historical and, and ethnic and identity issues. And the idea that you raise at the end, of course, is that the Washington principles should be for more. It should be actually, as we said, both Eisenstadt and I have both said, that it is to play back to the never again building the F effort to stop ethnic cleansing and, and what Putin is doing in, in Ukraine. We haven't been successful, but those were embodied in it. So the media and the, much of the, the negotiations have been on high value issues of the Klimts and all the issues that go around that, but that was not our intention. Our intention was indeed, as you said, to have the cultural identity of the Jewish community in Europe recognized in all of its aspects, not just the private property aspects. And I will say that that is, of course, not, not changed. Now, we do have a, a difference in who manages or who should be in charge of airless art. That was a very big discussion at Vilnius. And we came to the conclusion that we would not accept the Israeli position that they would be responsible for all airless art. That was a, a, an agreement that was done. But let me just add those two comments. But again, we're not that far apart. And we actually, uh, when we did the 20th anniversary, we bought into uh, Macron's question about the Benin bronzes and added that into the presentation and, and into some of the articles, including the one that I wrote. Thank you. Thank you, James. I'm in complete agreement with you. I also don't uh, think that states should be uh, the only responsible, and I'm advocating for uh, for recognizing groups in different constellations. And I'm really glad to hear about the initial intention to put culture and not uh, just artworks uh, like Klimt in the center. And I think the 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 more we get uh, uh, further away. And we see how little we gain with the individual property restitution. We should begin to think about communities and about memory framework and about relationship. So I think this is the way forward. And I thank you for it. Thank you very much. I see uh, our dear colleague, Professor Mayo Moran from the University of Toronto. Great, Mayo, that you are with us. Uh, please, your question. Oh, thank you so much. I just, um, I'm not so sure it's so much a question as as just a comment. First of all, it's lovely uh, to see all of you, Leora. We haven't seen each other for, for quite a while, but I found this really um, insightful and just wanted to pick up a little bit on Leora's point um, in the context of post-colonial restitution. And and to suggest, and I, I think that uh, JD, uh, you were kind of going in this direction, that there is a kind of a reciprocal learning between the original uh, Washington principle paradigm, which is very much influenced by a private law property model. And what, um, Lior, I think what you were talking about as mm -hmm. what I see as an emerging um, partner, maybe a another way to understand restitution in a more contextual um, framework. And, uh, you know, in, in countries like Canada, uh, we're also looking at colonial heritage in countries like Canada. Our Indigenous people have learned a lot from the Holocaust model, but they have also pushed that model in certain ways that I think could be in turn instructive for the original Holocaust related discussions and um, some of the ways they have pushed that. And one I just sort of wanted to, to mention and Matthias will be familiar with this because it was sort of something I put in some other submissions. Um, but one of the suggestions that I think is implicit is that there are certain contexts in which the default assumption uh, should be that transactions are suspect and not that transactions are good. <laughs> and then you have to prove the opposite. And so 
I see some of this actually showing up now in the Holocaust context, um, in some of the work being done, um, for example, in, in, in Holland and in some other places. And so I guess I just wondered for those of you that are closer on, on to the Holocaust restitution uh, paradigm, how much you think it can learn um, from this um, alternative understanding of restitution that I think is beginning to emerge it, I see it in military law 59, um, but I also see that then feeding forward into uh, a, a way to approach colonial taking. So sort of long-winded, I'm not sure how much it's a question, but it's a really fascinating discussion. And thank you for allowing me to join. Thank you, Mayo. It is such a pleasure to see you again. Uh, I mentioned in my uh, talk the collaboration in the first uh, uh, conference and in the uh, uh, to, uh, second conference as well. Uh, so welcome here, but I think Matthias will certainly uh, have something to say about this uh, uh, presumption, legal presumption. So Matthias, to you. Thank you, Vera, and thank you, Mayor, for this um, rich question. I think um, we should indeed make clear that um, what you called for in other contexts uh, is already present or was present at an early stage under military government law number 59, which is a presumption um, uh, in favor of persecuted persons um, that transactions um, uh, would be tainted as a matter of uh, presumption as well. And uh, then only um, certain um, uh, elements of uh, rebuttal were allowed by this uh, by this um, uh, legislation, and that's still the core of our assessment framework um, um, uh, today when we deal with uh, Nazi looted art today. And I remember um, uh, presenting the German Handreichung in uh, one of our classes, and one of the reactions was that well. It's not the assessment framework that seems to pose any major problems in, in this respect, um, maybe other, other, other issues. Let me just make try to make one more comparison uh, in that respect. The German government has just started embarking on the issue of colonial um, contexts and the restitution of colonial objects. And it is striking to me that uh, the government decided to start exactly the same way as the governments before started in 1998 afterwards to implement the Washington Principles. There is a bilateral negotiation envisaged by the legislator and uh, the museums and the claimants are supposed to come to terms to find a just and fair solution. And that's it. And uh, this has turned out today in the field of Nazi looted art as no longer satisfactory for a number of reasons. That would be a, that would be very um, uh, complex to go further into the points that uh, would contribute to this uh, state of things. But it's interesting to see that in another field there is there is the same starting point. Um, and uh, so my prediction would be that in twenty five years in the colonial context we might have the same situation that we are coming back from moral reasoning to more legal uh, settings and procedures and bodies to decide these questions. But I think we would then, we would need this 25 years experience to reach this point to somehow configure and think about an assessment framework that is then more detailed based on the experience of the case law, so to speak, than before. And uh, maybe that is a very, that is going to be a very parallel um, development. We will see. Thank you. Other questions? I see Alfred Fass, please. Uh, thank you, Matthias. Um, first of all, I want to thank especially you and Liora for your huge accomplishment doing for three of these courses. And uh, I've been participating uh, off and on for these three years. And every time, every course was interesting. Every course was very, very well prepared and I do hope that other universities will take your lead and see it as a precedent and it's a great way to um, uh, to further the restitution of looted art. Uh, I would like to speak a little bit, a couple of points regarding the next 25 years. 
that is the subject of the, this night. First of all, um, again, I was invited um, uh, each time for each course um, uh, during the three years, so I did it for three times. And the emphasis on the claimants is becoming more and more important, especially since we're looking at the third, fourth, or even fifth generation. And I'm grateful to see that overall um, the restitution commissions and people are engaged in this subject do understand that it's all about the claimants in the end of the day. Um, I think what is important for the next 25 years is the next generation of researchers and lawyers and, prov and provenance people and art people, the next generation to get them engaged. And that was so important with your courses that um, uh, students got a first taste about restitution. And I do hope there will be more and more initiatives to um, teach about restitution and to give opportunities for young researchers to work in this field. Um, the restatements, uh, Lothar, um, uh, Matthias, you have been working on for the last five years is gonna be very, very important. I have no doubt about it. Um, there has been so much done, but on the other hand, there is so much confusion about guidelines and about decisions of the five restitution commissions and also regarding the um, the cases we have in the United States. So it would be really, uh, we're all waiting for this restatement and to see what we can learn from it. Um, maybe as last point for the next 25 years, the possibility of a unification of the five restitution or six or seven, hopefully there will be more, in the European Union. Today, each country has its own restitution commission, and we know we have same cases, different uh, verdicts, different advices. Um, so I think we all should try in the next 25 years to get some order in it, and if possible, to get a unified restitution commission, commission or one coordinating commission for the all of Europe um, in order to, to get better results than we have today with restitution. Again, thank you very much. And um, I really, really am moved by all the efforts you made. And you know, the three years, it, it was a great, uh, it was a great show and I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, words. Yes, thank you very, very much. It's um, great to hear that. It was a true privilege and pleasure having you in these classes and to listen to your views, to your perspectives. And each of these discussions um, was extremely enriching. Um, and I, I'm glad to hear that um, it appears convincing the position that we should strive for more standardization without petrifying things. I mean, that's sometimes um, a fear that is formulated, that rules might make decisions or decision makers, uh, might bind decision makers panels too strictly. Me as a legal scholar, I never feel this fear because I know from my own research on state court decisions that there is so much room left once you apply rules that are um, applicable to the case that there is not the slightest danger of petrifying, of uh, strictly binding a decisional body. So that is something I would like to add to what you were saying. And if we were ready to accept this for a moment, we would be free to explore the virtues of a stronger standardization because it would speed up the process. It would make results more predictable. It would bring things a little bit back to a kind of legal sphere, but I would 
like to describe this in a positive sense, because we are not speaking about resurrecting um, legalistic um, impediments to, to restitution, but to speak about uh, a reliable assessment framework that um, is clear about its underlying concepts. And that is something we are trying to do. Uh, we are looking forward to the discussion. It's only a few months ahead of us, and uh, then we will take some days off after releasing this uh, to the public. But I hope, of course, that we will be able to contribute uh, in some way to a better uh, framework and a better foundation for thinking uh, about just and fair solutions and for producing justice. And as we know, um, moral thinking may be volatile over time, whereas a legal framework may also stabilize um, over time um, and keep things in the right directions. That's maybe something I would like to add from my perspective. Thank you for your intervention. Other questions? Uh, uh, I don't see questions. Oh, Michal, please. Thank you. Our much. student. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the course. I really and truly enjoyed and I learned a lot. I want to make a few remarks about the colonial context, as Professor Bilski has uh, mentioned. First of all, with regard to the South Savoy report, it generated a huge response and a huge reaction around the world, but effectively the outcome of the restitution from France to Africa is a total failure, I must admit, because so far only less than 30 artifacts were returned from France to Dahomey, where in the Hebranli, Jacques Chirac Museum, there are more between 70,000 to 90,000 artifacts which were looted from the by the by France during the colonial era. And this is probably because the South Savoy report has offered um, a mechanism, a legal mechanism, which could not be implied because of the um, because of the internal legal um, situation in France. And although the Probably the motive of uh, uh, Macron, Emmanuel Macron, in his um, Burkina Faso um, um, speech back in 2070 was political, effectively, it has not achieved what he claimed to achieve. He said, within five years, I want the restitution to be fulfilled. That's my first point. Regarding the indigenous, the indigenous population, I totally agree with Professor Bilski that there is a there is a a, 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 a a start of understanding their importance, but very humbly I would like to say that there are two uh two um um instruments that have made towards uh, recognizing these two these um uh, communities first is the 27 the 20, the 2007 declaration by the united nation and just recently the 2022 in mexico which recognized the importance of the indigenous uh, population Indeed, the Vatican has, if I understand correctly, if my memory doesn't, if my memory serves me correctly, the Vatican has returned um, uh, artifacts to Canada, to indigenous population, in, a community in Canada. Um, but I agree with uh, Professor Bielski stating that the, the next um, the next trend will be the uh, from private to community. And thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, address this point. 
Thank you so much, Michal. I think we are running out of time and I don't want to elaborate, but I, uh, I thank you for uh, looking at the practical and seeing how the law doesn't only come as a savior, but as the obstacle that uh, keeps on uh, 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 stopping us. But I wanted to hear more questions and to conclude the, co the conference. So we will have a chance to talk about it privately, I hope. Thank you so much, Michelle, for your question. There is one question left. Is it acceptable that we hear Eleonore Tode? Um, I hope so. Please, Eleonore, your question. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you as well for the very interesting presentation tonight. Uh, my name is Eleonore Tode, and I'm a Dutch provenance researcher. And I did a research on the Russian trophy art law in the light of the Western principles. And I was especially curious about Mr. Weller's idea uh, of the standard practices of restitution. Uh, we see that there are many countries that also have their own interpretation of the Western principles. Uh, as an example, we see that Russia has embraced uh, the concept, concept of compensatory restitution, like Eisenstadt also mentioned, and thus appropriating natural art. Uh, and one could argue that this goes entirely against the just and fair solutions of the Washington principles. I was wondering, how do you uh, view this? And especially, do you think that the Washington principles might be seen as a framework only appropriated for the Western countries? And that, for example, uh, for the so-called Eastern problem, this is a suited solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena, for this uh, important question. Um, if I understood correctly, your question directs at the methodology, so to speak, uh, for standardization. First point I would like to make is that standardization does not mean binding effect. I think I have to underline this uh, ever and ever again, because there are some misconceptions um, around. So uh, a standard is simply a suggestion if it's not laid down in the legislation and that's not what we are doing and that's not what we are intending it's an academic uh, work that has reviewed 1300 cases um, on nazi looted art on the restitution of nazi looted art or other just and fair solutions and we were trying to distill from the reasonings from the very diverse and sometimes chaotic reasons or reasonings or sometimes incomplete reasons um, the tipping points, the normative considerations and values. And that is, of course, only possible if you have a large body of material. And in, in your field, I, if I understand correctly, there is not yet so much of material. It's uh, growing and it's growing very diversely as it is typical at the beginning of the growth of a normative order. But maybe it's not yet um, the stage um, where it makes sense to approach the material with our method. Um, but that's just um, a first assumption, I would say. And um, I don't see any Western bias in the Washington principles. Maybe I'm not seeing everything clearly um, right away, but I don't see that so much. I read, of course, about ownership issues in the Washington Principles. And we would have to think about ownership concepts in other contexts of injustice, like the colonial context, where this opposition between former owner and current owner does not make um, the same sense than it makes in the context of the Holocaust. I think that is a difference between these two areas. Um, but apart from that, um, just and fair solutions, that is such a broad concept that is um, uh, is capable of being uh, applied meaningfully in each and every context of transitional justice. So I would hope that the notion would also grow into your field, but of course it will be a different discourse and different arguments on the table than in the field of the Holocaust, I would guess. Thank you, Eleanor. Much. If I can just jump in, I think that uh, it's a, a, a huge lacuna, the discussion of East Europe and uh, uh, what is happening there. I, uh, I, I began a discussion with a colleague in Poland about the idea of collective restitution, and it can be sometimes furthering the, the victim group, sometimes it can be misused 
as a way to keep everything under a uh, state uh, uh, control. So I think this is another uh, part of the next 25 years to 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 get it on the table, the different uh, uh, understanding. If we go beyond individual private property, what do we mean? Where is the rehabilitation, the compensation and the restitution? And I think uh, you pointed to a very important uh, question that we did not discuss in the class and we should have a conference and begin the discussion. It's a, it's a hugely important question. So there is food for classes and research and also political action for the next 25 years, if I gather it correctly. We have been now online in a fascinating um, uh, conference in my mind for the last two hours. I think uh, we should, uh, in order to protect ourselves, that's what we also learned in our classes over the last three years, to, uh, to we, we should close, um, but uh, please stay tuned and uh, yeah, try to participate in these projects as so many others did as guest speakers, as students, as guest students. And that was also a fascinating aspect of our of our courses that we had such a diverse student body, also in terms of age and um, backgrounds in general. Lira, the last word is yours. My last word is that uh, we began this whole project with the, the with the words that uh, Mayo Moran suggested to call it restitution dialogues, and I think this is the the core idea. It's a dialogue between principles, law and art and history. And it is a dialogue between nations, between states, between uh, 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 notions of restitution. And we should keep to this uh, idea of a dialogue. Uh, and thank you, everyone. It was and still is a very exciting project uh, to think about. Well, Leora and Matt, Matthias, let me also add my thanks. It was a very good, very enlightening. And after 25 years of working on this subject, it's wonderful to see that you're working for the next 25 years. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you thank so you much, much for your contribution for today. Thank you so much. And, and thank you, all. everyone. And especially thank you for our teams. It was a, a, a teamwork uh, on Tel Aviv, Shelley and uh, Eyal and, uh, and Dorit on the yeah. one. And thank you. First of all, for our students. Thank you, Matthias. Stay tuned and take care. Have a good night. Thank you.